Jazz is a genre of American music that originated in the late 19th and early 20th century in the southern United States as a combination of European harmony and forms with African musical elements such as blue notes, improvisation, polyrhythms, syncopation and the swung note. Jazz has also incorporated elements of American popular music. As jazz spread around the world, it drew on different national, regional, and local musical cultures, giving rise to many distinctive styles, New Orleans jazz dating from the early 1910s, Big Brand Swing, Kansas City jazz and Gypsy jazz from the 1930s and 1940s, Bebop from the mid-1940s, Afro-Cuban jazz, West Coast jazz, ska jazz, cool jazz, Indo jazz, avant-garde jazz, soul jazz, modal jazz, chamber jazz, free jazz, Latin jazz, smooth jazz, Jazz fusion and jazz rock, jazz funk, loft jazz, punk jazz, acid jazz, ethno jazz, jazz rap, m bass and new jazz. Louis Armstrong, one of the most famous musicians in jazz, said to Bing Crosby on the latter's radio show, Ah, swing, well, we used to call it syncopation, then they called it ragtime, then blues, then jazz. Now, it's swing. In a 1988 interview, jazz musician J.J. Johnson said, Jazz is restless. It won't stay put and it never will. Definitions Jazz spans a range of music from ragtime to the present day a Euro a period of over 100 years a Euro, and has proved to be very difficult to define. Attempts have been made to define jazz from the perspective of other musical traditions a Euro using the point of view of European music history or African music, for example, Euro. But critic Joachim Ernst Berendt argues that its terms of reference and its definition should be broader. Berendt defines jazz as a form of art music which originated in the United States through the confrontation of the Negro with European music, and argues that it differs from European music in that jazz has a special relationship to time defined as swing, involves a spontaneity and vitality of musical production in which improvisation plays a role and contains a sonority and manner of phrasing which mirror the individuality of the performing jazz musician. A broader definition that encompasses all of the radically different eras of jazz has been proposed by Travis Jackson, he states that it is music that includes qualities such as swing, improvising, group interaction, developing an individual voice, and being open to different musical possibilities. An overview of the discussion on definitions is provided by Kryn Gabbard, who argues that jazz is a construct that, while artificial, still is useful to designate a number of musics with enough in common to be understood as part of a coherent tradition. In contrast to the efforts of commentators and enthusiasts of certain types of jazz, who have argued for narrower definitions that exclude other types, the musicians themselves are often reluctant to define the music they play. Duke Ellington, one of jazz's most famous figures, summed up this perspective by saying, it's all music. Importance of improvisation. While jazz is considered difficult to define, improvisation is consistently regarded as being one of its key elements. The centrality of improvisation in jazz is attributed to its presence in influential earlier forms of music, the early blues, a form of folk music which arose in part from the work songs and field hollers of the African American workers on plantations. These were commonly structured around a repetitive call and response pattern, but early blues was also highly improvisational. Although European classical music has been said to be a composer's medium in which the performer is sometimes granted discretion over interpretation, ornamentation and accompaniment, the performer's primary goal is to play a composition as it was written. In contrast, jazz is often characterized as the product of group creativity, interaction, and collaboration that places varying degrees of value on the contributions of composer and performers. In jazz, therefore, the skilled performer will interpret a tune in very individual ways, never playing the same composition exactly the same way twice. Depending upon the performer's mood and personal experience, interactions with other musicians, or even members of the audience, a jazz musician may alter melodies, harmonies or time signature at will. The approach to improvisation has developed enormously over the history of the music. In early New Orleans and Dixieland jazz, performers took turns playing the melody, while others improvised counter-melodies, 
By the swing era, big bands were coming to rely more on arranged music, arrangements were either written or learned by ear and memorized, while individual soloists would improvise within these arrangements. Later, in bebop the focus shifted back towards small groups and minimal arrangements. The melody would be stated briefly at the start and end of a piece, but the core of the performance would be the series of improvisations. Later styles such as modal jazz abandoned the strict notion of a chord progression, allowing the individual musicians to improvise even more freely within the context of a given scale or mode. In many forms of jazz a soloist is often supported by a rhythm section that accompanies by playing chords and rhythms that outline the song structure and complement the soloist. In avant-garde and free jazz idioms, the separation of soloist and band is reduced, and there is license, or even a requirement, for the abandoning of chords, scales, and rhythmic meters. Debates, since at least the emergence of bebop, Forms of jazz that are commercially oriented or influenced by popular music have been criticized by purists. According to Bruce Johnson, there has always been a tension between jazz as a commercial music and an art form. Traditional jazz enthusiasts have dismissed bebop, free jazz, the 1970s jazz fusion era, and much else as periods of debasement of the music and betrayals of the tradition. The alternative viewpoint is that jazz is able to absorb and transform influences from diverse musical styles, and that, by avoiding the creation of norms, other newer, avant-garde forms of jazz will be free to emerge. Another debate that gained a lot of attention at the birth of jazz was how it would affect the appearance of African Americans, in particular, who were a part of it. To some African Americans, Jazz has highlighted their contribution to American society and helped bring attention to black history and culture, but for others, the music and term jazz are reminders of an oppressive and racist society and restrictions on their artistic visions. Etymology The origin of the word jazz has had widespread interest A Euro the American dialect society named it the word of the 20th century A Euro, which has resulted in considerable research, and its history is well documented. The word began, under various spellings as West Coast slang around 1912, the meaning of which varied but did not refer to music. The use of the word in a musical context was documented as early as 1915 in the Chicago Daily Tribune. Its first documented use in a musical context in New Orleans appears in a November 14, 1916 Times Picallon article about jazz bands. Race Imam Amiri Barakat argues that there is a distinct white jazz music genre expressive of whiteness. The first white jazz musicians appeared in the early 1920s in the Midwestern United States. Bix Beidebeck was one of the most prominent white jazz musicians. History, origins, blended African and European music sensibilities. By 1808 the Atlantic slave trade had brought almost half a million sub-Saharan Africans to the United States. The slaves largely came from West Africa and the Greater Congo River Basin. They brought strong musical traditions with them. The rhythms had a counter-metric structure, and reflected African speech patterns. African music was largely functional, for work or ritual. The African traditions made use of a single-line melody and call-and-response pattern, but without the European concept of harmony. Slave gatherings Lavish festivals featuring African-based dances to drums were organized on Sundays at Place Congo, or Congo Square, in New Orleans until 1843. There are historical accounts of other music and dance gatherings elsewhere in the southern United States. Robert Palmer commented on percussive slave music. Usually such music was associated with annual festivals, when the year's crop was harvested and several days were set aside for celebration. As late as 1861, a traveler in North Carolina saw dancers dressed in costumes that included horned headdresses and cowtails and heard music provided by a sheepskin covered gumbo box, apparently a frame drum. Triangles and jaw bones furnished the auxiliary percussion. There are quite a few accounts from the southeastern states and Louisiana dating from the period 1820 Euro 1850. Some of the earliest Mississippi Delta settlers come from the vicinity of New Orleans, where drumming was never actively discouraged for very long and homemade drums were used to accompany public dancing until the outbreak of the Civil War. The Black Church, 
Another influence came from black slaves who had learned the harmonic style of hymns of the church, and incorporated it into their own music as spirituals. The origins of the blues are undocumented, though they can be seen as the secular counterpart of the spirituals. However, as Gerard Kibbick points out, whereas the spirituals are homophonic, rural blues and early jazz was largely based on concepts of heterophony. Minstrel and Salon Music During the early 19th century an increasing number of black musicians learned to play European instruments, particularly the violin, which they used to parody European dance music in their own cakewalk dances. In turn, European-American minstrel show performers in blackface popularized the music internationally, combining syncopation with European harmonic accompaniment. In the mid-1800s the white New Orleans composer Louis Moreau Gottschalk adapted slave rhythms and melodies from Cuba and other Caribbean islands, into piano salon music. New Orleans was the main nexus between the Afro-Caribbean and African-American cultures. African rhythmic retention, in the opinion of jazz historian Ernest Bonman, what preceded New Orleans jazz before 1890 was Afro-Latin music similar to what was played in the Caribbean at the time. A fundamental rhythmic figure heard in Gottstrick's compositions such as Souvenirs from Havana, many different slave musics of the Caribbean, as well as Afro-Caribbean folk dances performed in New Orleans Congo Square, is the three-stroke pattern known in Cuban music as Tricillo. Tricillo is the most basic and most prevalent duple pulse rhythmic cell in sub-Saharan African music traditions, and the music of the African diaspora. The Black Codes outlawed drumming by slaves. Therefore, unlike in Cuba, Haiti, and elsewhere in the Caribbean, African drumming traditions were not preserved in North America. African-based rhythmic patterns were retained in the United States in large part through body rhythms such as stomping, clapping, and patting tuba. In the post-Civil War period, African Americans were able to obtain surplus military bass drums, snare drums and fifes. As a result, an original African American drum and fife music arose, featuring tricillo and related syncopated rhythmic figures. With this emerged a drumming tradition that was distinct from its Caribbean counterparts, expressing a uniquely African American sensibility. Palmer observes, the snare and bass drummers played syncopated cross rhythms, and speculates a euro of this tradition must have dated back to the latter half of the 19th century, and it could have not have developed in the first place if there hadn't been a reservoir of polyrhythmic sophistication in the culture it nurtured. Tricillo is heard prominently in New Orleans second line music, and in other forms of popular music from that city from the turn of the 20th century to present. Jazz historian Gunther Schaller commented on its retention in jazz. By and large the simpler African rhythmic patterns survived in jazz. Because they could be adapted more readily to European rhythmic conceptions. Some survived, others were discarded as the Europeanization progressed. Spanish tinge Euro The Afro-Cuban rhythmic influence, African American music began incorporating Afro-Cuban rhythmic motifs in the 19th century, when the Habana regained international popularity. Habaneras were widely available as sheet music. The Habanera was the first written music to be rhythmically based on an African motif. From the perspective of African American music, the Habanera rhythm can be thought of as a combination of tricillo and the backbeat. Musicians from Havana and New Orleans would take the twice daily ferry between both cities to perform, and not surprisingly, the Habanera quickly took root in the musically fertile Crescent City. The Habana was the first of many Cuban music genres which enjoyed periods of popularity in the United States, and reinforced and inspired the use of tricillo-based rhythms in African-American music. John Storm Roberts states that the musical genre Habana reached the U.S. 20 years before the first rag was published. The piano piece Ojo's Cryolos by New Orleans native Louis Moreau Gottschalk, was influenced by the composer's studies in Cuba. The Habana rhythm is clearly heard in the left hand. With Gottschalk's symphonic work A Night in the Tropics, we hear the tricillo variant Cinquillo extensively. A figure was later used by Scott Joplin and other ragtime composers. For the more than quarter century in which the cakewalk, ragtime, and proto jazz were forming and developing, the Habana was a consistent part of African American popular music.
Comparing the music of New Orleans with the music of Cuba, Winton Marsalis observes that Tresillo is the New Orleans clave, a Spanish word meaning code, or key euro as in the key to a puzzle, or mystery. Although technically the pattern is only half a clave, Marsalis makes the point that the single cell figure is the guide pattern of New Orleans music. Jelly Roll Morton called the rhythmic figure the Spanish tinge, and considered it an essential ingredient of jazz. 1890s R Euro 1910s, Ragtime. The abolition of slavery in 1865 led to new opportunities for the education of freed African Americans. Although strict segregation limited employment opportunities for most blacks, many were able to find work in entertainment. Black musicians were able to provide entertainment in dances, minstrel shows, and in vaudeville, by which many marching bands formed. Black pianists played in bars, clubs, and brothels, as ragtime developed. Ragtime appeared a sheet music, popularized by African American musicians such as the entertainer Ernest Hogan, whose hit songs appeared in 1895. Two years later, Vess Osman recorded a medley of these songs as a banjo solo, Ragtime Medley. Also in 1897, the white composer William H. Krell published his Mississippi Rag as the first written piano instrumental ragtime piece, and Tom Turpin published his Harlem Rag, the first rag published by an African American. The classically trained pianist Scott Joplin produced his original rags in the following year, then in 1899 had an international hit with Maple Leaf Rag. The latter is a multi-strain rag time march with four parts that feature recurring themes and a bass line with copious seventh chords. Its structure was the basis for many other rags, and the syncopations in the right hand, especially in the transition between the first and second strain, were novel at the time. African-based rhythmic patterns such as Tresillo and its variants a Euro the Habana a rhythm and Cinquillo a Euro are heard in the ragtime compositions of Joplin, Turpin, and others. Joplin's solace is generally considered to be within the Habana genre, and both of the pianist's hands play in a syncopated fashion, completely abandoning any sense of a march rhythm. Ned Sublett postulates that the Tresillo Habana rhythm found its way into ragtime and the cakewalk, while Roberts suggests that the Habana influence may have been part of what freed black music from ragtime's European base. Blues African Genesis Blues is the name given to both a musical form and a music genre that originated in African American communities of primarily the deep south of the United States at the end of the 19th century from spirituals, work songs, field hollers, shouts and chants, and rhymed simple narrative ballads. The African use of pentatonic scales contributed to the development of blue notes in blues and jazz. As Kibbuk explains, Many of the rural blues of the Deep South are stylistically an extension and merger of basically two broad accompanied song style traditions in the West Central Sudanic Belt, a strongly Arabic Islamic song style, as found for example among the Hausa. It is characterized by melisma, wavy intonation, pitch instabilities within a pentatonic framework, and a declamatory voice. An ancient West Central Sudanic stratum of pentatonic song composition, often associated with simple work rhythms in a regular meter, but with notable offbeat accents. W. C. Handy, Early Published Blues W. C. Handy became intrigued with the folk blues of the Deep South while traveling through the Mississippi Delta. In this form, the singer improvised freely, and the melodic range was limited, sounding like a field holler. The guitar accompaniment was not strummed, but was instead slapped, like a small drum that responded in syncopated accents. The guitar was another voice. Handy and his band members were formerly trained African American musicians who did not grow up with the blues, yet he was able to adopt the blues to a larger band instrument format, and arrange them in a popular music form. Handy wrote about his adopting of the blues. The primitive Southern Negro, as he sang, was sure to bear down on the third and seventh tone of the scale, slurring between major and minor. Whether in the cotton field of the Delta or on the levee up St. Louis Way, it was always the same. Till then, however, I had never heard this slur used by a more sophisticated Negro, or by any white man. I tried to convey this effect by introducing flat thirds and sevenths into my song, although its prevailing key was major. <laughs>
and I carried this device into my melody as well. The 1912 publication of his Memphis Blues sheet music introduced the 12-bar blues to the world. This composition, as well as his later St. Louis blues, and others, included the Habana rhythm, and became jazz standards. Handy's music career began in the pre-jazz era, and contributed to the codification of jazz, through the publication of some of the first jazz sheet music. Within the context of Western harmony, the blues form, ubiquitous in jazz, is characterized by specific chord progressions, of which the 12-bar blues progression is the most common. The blue notes that, for expressive purposes, are sung or played flattened or gradually bent in relation to the pitch of the major scale, are also an important part of the sound. The blues were the key that opened up an entirely new approach to Western harmony, ultimately leading to a high level of harmonic complexity in jazz. New Orleans The music of New Orleans had a profound effect on the creation of early jazz. Many early jazz performers played in venues throughout the city. The brothels and bars of the red light district around Basin Street, called Stowreville was only one of numerous neighborhoods relevant to the early days of New Orleans jazz. In addition to dance bands, numerous marching bands played at lavish funerals, later called jazz funerals, arranged by the African American and European American communities. The instruments used in marching bands and dance bands became the basic instruments of jazz, brass and reeds tuned in the European 12-tone scale and drums. Small bands mixing self-taught and well-educated African American musicians, many of whom came from the funeral procession tradition of New Orleans, played a seminal role in the development and dissemination of early jazz, traveling throughout black communities in the Deep South and, from around 1914 on, Afro-Creole and African-American musicians playing in vaudeville shows took jazz to western and northern U.S. cities. Syncopation, the cornetist Buddy Bolden led a band often mentioned as one of the prime movers of the style later to be called jazz. He played in New Orleans around 1895 or Euro 1906, but became mentally ill and there are no recordings of him playing. Bolden's band is credited with creating the Big Four, the first syncopated bass drum pattern to deviate from the standard on the beat march. As the example below shows, the second half of the Big Four pattern is the Habana rhythm. Afro-Creole pianist Jelly Roll Morton began his career in Stowerville. From 1904, he toured with vaudeville shows around southern cities, also playing in Chicago and New York. His Jelly Roll Blues, which he composed around 1905, was published in 1915 as the first jazz arrangement in print, introducing more musicians to the New Orleans style. Morton considered the Tresilla Habanera to be an essential ingredient of jazz. In his own words, now in one of my earliest tunes, New Orleans Blues, you can notice the Spanish tinge. In fact, if you can't manage to put tinges of Spanish in your tunes, you will never be able to get the right seasoning, I call it, for jazz. Some early jazz musicians referred to their music as ragtime. Morton was a crucial innovator in the evolution from ragtime to jazz piano. He could perform pieces in either style. Morton's solos were still close to ragtime, and were not merely improvisations over chord changes, as with later jazz. His use of the blues was of equal importance however. Swing, Morton loosened ragtime's rigid rhythmic feeling, decreasing its embellishments, and employing a swing feeling. Swing is the most important, and enduring African-based rhythmic technique used in jazz. An oft-quoted definition of swing by Louis Armstrong is, if you don't feel it, you'll never know it. The new Harvard Dictionary of Music states that swing is, an intangible rhythmic momentum in jazz. Swing defies analysis. Claims to its presence may inspire arguments. However, the dictionary does provide the useful description of triple subdivisions of the beat contrasted with duple subdivisions. Swing superimposes six subdivisions of the beat over a basic pulse structure or four subdivisions. This aspect of swing is far more prevalent in African American music than in Afro Caribbean music. One aspect of swing, which is heard in more rhythmically complex diaspora musics, places strokes in between the triple and duple pulse grids, 
New Orleans brass bands are a lasting influence contributing horn players to the world of professional jazz with the distinct sound of the city while helping black children escape poverty. The leader of the Camellia brass band, Dharma Gania, taught Louis Armstrong to play trumpet. Armstrong popularized the New Orleans style of trumpet playing, and then expanded it. Like Jelly Roll Morton, Armstrong is also credited with the abandonment of ragtime stiffness, in favor of swung notes. Armstrong, perhaps more than any other musician, codified the rhythmic technique of swing in jazz, and broadened the jazz solo vocabulary. The original Dixieland Jazz Band made the music's first recordings early in 1917, and their livery stable blues became the earliest released jazz record. That year numerous other bands made recordings featuring jazz in the title or band name, mostly ragtime or novelty records rather than jazz. In February 1918 James Reese Europe's Hellfighters Infantry Band took ragtime to Europe during World War I, then on return recorded Dixieland standards including Darktown Strutter's Ball. Other regions, in the northeastern United States, a hot style of playing ragtime had developed, notably James Reese Europe's Symphonic Clef Club Orchestra in New York which played a benefit concert at Carnegie Hall in 1912. The Baltimore rag style of U.B. Blake influenced James P. Johnson's development of stride piano playing, in which the right hand plays the melody, while the left hand provides the rhythm and bass line. In Ohio and elsewhere in the Midwest, ragtime was the major influence until about 1919. Around 1912, when the four-string banjo and saxophone came in, the musicians began to improvise the melody line, but the harmony and rhythm remained unchanged. A contemporary account states that blues could only be heard in jazz, in the gut bucket cabarets, which were generally looked down upon by the black middle class. 1920s and 1930s, the Jazz Age. Prohibition in the United States banned the sale of alcoholic drinks, resulting in illicit speakeasies becoming lively venues of the Jazz Age, an era when popular music included current dance songs, novelty songs, and show tunes. Jazz started to get a reputation as being immoral and many members of the older generation saw it as threatening the old values in culture and promoting the new decadent values of the Roaring Twenties. Professor Henry Van Dyke of Princeton University wrote, It is not music at all. It's merely an irritation of the nerves of hearing, a sensual teasing of the strings of physical passion. Even the media began to denigrate jazz. The New York Times took stories and altered headlines to pick at jazz. For instance, villagers used pots and pans in Siberia to scare off bears, and the newspaper stated that it was jazz that scared the bears away. Another story claims that jazz caused the death of a celebrated conductor. The actual cause of death was a fatal heart attack. From 1919 Kid Orr's original Creole jazz band of musicians from New Orleans played in San Francisco and Los Angeles where in 1922 they became the first black jazz band of New Orleans origin to make recordings. However, the main center developing the new hot jazz was Chicago, where King Oliver joined Bill Johnson. That year also saw the first recording by Bessie Smith, the most famous of the 1920s blues singers. Big Spiderbeck formed the Wolverines in 1924. Also in 1924 Louis Armstrong joined the Fletcher Henderson dance band as featured soloist for a year. The original New Orleans style was polyphonic, with theme variation, and simultaneous collective improvisation. Armstrong was a master of his hometown style, but by the time he joined Henderson's band, he was already a trailblazer in a new phase of jazz with its emphasis on arrangements and soloists. Armstrong's solos went well beyond the theme improvisation concept, and extemporized on chords, rather than melodies. According to Schuller, by comparison, the solos by Armstrong's bandmates, sounded stiff, stodgy, with jerky rhythms and a grey undistinguished tone quality. The following example shows a short excerpt of the straight melody of Mandy, Make Up Your Mind by George W. Mayer and Arthur Johnston, compared with Armstrong's solo improvisations. The example approximates Armstrong's solo, as it doesn't convey his use of swing. Armstrong's solos were a significant factor in making jazz a true 20th century language. After leaving Henderson's group, Armstrong formed his virtuosic Hot Five band, 
where he popularized scat singing. Jelly Roll Morton recorded with the New Orleans Rhythm Kings in an early mixed race collaboration, then in 1926 formed his Red Hot Peppers. There was a larger market for jazzy dance music played by white orchestras, such as Gene Colquette's orchestra and Paul Whiteman's orchestra. In 1924 Whiteman commissioned Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, which was premiered by Whiteman's orchestra. Other influential large ensembles included Fletcher Henderson's band, Duke Ellington's band in New York, and Earl Hines' band in Chicago. All significantly influenced the development of big band-style swing jazz. By 1930, the New Orleans-style ensemble was a relic, and jazz belonged to the world. Swing The 1930s belonged to popular swing big bands, in which some virtuoso soloists became as famous as the band leaders. Key figures in developing the big jazz band included band leaders and arrangers Count Basie, Cab Calloway, Jimmy and Tommy Dorsey, Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, Fletcher Henderson, Earl Hines, Glenn Miller and Artie Shaw. Swing was also dance music. It was broadcast on the radio Live Nightly across America for many years especially by Earl Hines and his Grand Terrace Cafe Orchestra broadcasting coast to coast from Chicago well-placed for live U.S. time zones. Although it was a collective sound, swing also offered individual musicians a chance to solo and improvise melodic, thematic solos which could at times be very complex and important music. Over time, social strictures regarding racial segregation began to relax in America, white band leaders began to recruit black musicians and black band leaders white ones. In the mid-1930s, Benny Goodman hired pianist Teddy Wilson, vibraphonist Lionel Hampton and guitarist Charlie Christian to join small groups. An early 1940s style known as Jumping the Blues, or Jump Blues used small combos, up-tempo music, and blues chord progressions. Jump Blues drew on boogie-woogie from the 1930s. Kansas City jazz in the 1930s as exemplified by tenor saxophonist Lester Young marked the transition from big brands to the bebop influence of the 1940s. Beginnings of European jazz Since only a limited amount of American jazz records were released there, Europe's jazz traces many of its roots to American artists such as James Reese Europe, Paul Whiteman, and Lonnie Johnson who visited Europe during and after World War I. It was their live performances and others like theirs that inspired European audiences' interest in jazz, as well as the interest in all things American, and therefore exotic, that accompanied the economic and political woes of Europe during this time. The beginnings of a distinct European style of jazz began to emerge in this interwar period. This distinct style entered full swing in France with the Quintet du Hot Club de France, which began in 1934. Much of this French jazz was a combination of African-American jazz and the symphonic styles in which French musicians were well trained. In this, it is easy to see the inspiration taken from Paul Whiteman, since his style was a fusion of the two. Belgian guitar virtuoso Django Reinhardt popularized gypsy jazz, a mix of 1930s American swing, French dance hall musette, and Eastern European folk with a languid, seductive feel. The main instruments are steel stringed guitar, violin, and double bass. Solos pass from one player to another as the guitar and bass play the role of the rhythm section. Some music researchers hold that it was Philadelphia's Eddie Lang and Joe Venuti who pioneered the guitar violin partnership typical of the genre, which was brought to France after they had been heard live or on OK Records in the late 1920s. 1940s and 1950s American music a Euro the influence of Ellington. By the 1940s, Duke Ellington's music transcended the bounds of swing, bridging jazz and art music in a natural synthesis. Ellington called his music American music rather than jazz, and liked to describe those who impressed him as beyond category. These included many of the musicians who were members of his orchestra, some of whom are considered among the best in jazz in their own right but it was Ellington who melded them into one of the most well-known jazz orchestral units in the history of jazz. He often composed specifically for the style and skills of these individuals, such as Jeep's Blues for Johnny Hodges, Concerto for Cootie for Cootie Williams, which later became Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me with Bob Russell's lyrics, and The Moshe for Tricky Sam Nanton and Bubba Miley.
He also recorded songs written by his bandsmen, such as Juan Tizzle's Caravan, and Perdido, which brought the Spanish tinge to big band jazz. Several members of the orchestra remained there for several decades. The band reached a creative peak in the early 1940s, when Ellington and a small hand-picked group of his composers and arrangers wrote for an orchestra of distinctive voices who displayed tremendous creativity. Bebop In the early 1940s bebop-style performers began to shift jazz from danceable popular music towards a more challenging musician's music. The most influential bebop musicians included saxophonist Charlie Parker, pianists Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk, trumpeters Dizzy Gillespie and Clifford Brown, and drummer Max Roach. Composer Gunther Schuller wrote, In 1943 I heard the great Earl Hines band which had Bird in it and all those other great musicians. They were playing all the flatted fifth chords and all the modern harmonies and substitutions and Dizzy Gillespie runs in the trumpet section work. Two years later I read that that was Bop and the beginning of modern jazz. But the band never made recordings. Divorcing itself from dance music, bebop established itself more as an art form, thus lessening its potential popular and commercial appeal. Dizzy Gillespie wrote, People talk about the Heinz Band being the incubator of bop and the leading exponents of that music ended up in the Heinz Band. But people also have the erroneous impression that the music was new. It was not. The music evolved from what went before. It was the same basic music. The difference was in how you got from here to here to here. Naturally each age has got its own shit. Rhythm, since bebop was meant to be listened to, not danced to, it could use faster tempos. Drumming shifted to a more elusive and explosive style, in which the right cymbal was used to keep time while the snare and bass drum were used for accents. This led to a highly syncopated, linear rhythmic complexity. Harmony Bebop musicians employed several harmonic devices not typical of previous jazz, engaging in a more abstracted form of chord-based improvisation. Bebop scales are traditional scales, with an added chromatic passing note. Bebop also uses passing chords, substitute chords, and altered chords. New forms of chromaticism and dissonance were introduced into jazz. The dissonant tritone interval became the most important interval of bebop chord progressions for bebop tunes were often taken directly from popular swing era songs and reused with a new and more complex melody, forming new compositions. This practice was already well established in earlier jazz, but came to be central to the bebop style. Bebop made use of several relatively common chord progressions, such as blues and rhythm changes, the chords to the 1930s pop standard I Got Rhythm. Late bop also moved towards extended forms that represented a departure from pop and show tunes. The harmonic development in bebop is often traced back to a transcendent moment experienced by Charlie Parker while performing Cherokee at Clark Monroe's Uptown House, New York, in early 1942. I'd been getting bored with the stereotype changes that were being used. And I kept thinking there's bound to be something else. I could hear it sometimes. I couldn't play it, I was working over a Euro Cherokee, a Euro unregistered trademark and, as I did, I found that by using the higher intervals of a chord as a melody line and backing them with appropriately related changes, I could play the thing I'd been hearing. It came a levier Euro Parker. Gerard Kibbick postulates that the harmonic development in bebop sprang from the blues, and other African-related tonal sensibilities, rather than 20th century Western art music, as some have suggested. Kibbick states, auditory inclinations were the African legacy in, Parker's, life, reconfirmed by the experience of the blues tonal system, a sound world at odds with the Western diatonic chord categories. Bebop musicians eliminated Western-style functional harmony in their music while retaining the strong central tonality of the blues as a basis for drawing upon various African matrices. Samuel Floyd states that blues were both the bedrock and propelling force of bebop, bringing about three main developments, a new harmonic conception, using extended chord structures that led to unprecedented harmonic and melodic variety, a developed and even more highly syncopated, 
linear rhythmic complexity and a melodic angularity in which the blue note of the fifth degree was established as an important melodic harmonic device. The re-establishment of the blues is the music's primary organizing and functional principle. While for an outside observer, the harmonic innovations in bebop would appear to be inspired by experiences in Western serious music, from Claude Debussy to Arnold Schoenberg, such a scheme cannot be sustained by the evidence from a cognitive approach. Claude Debussy did have some influence on jazz, for example, on Bix by Debeck's piano playing. And it is also true that Duke Ellington adopted and reinterpreted some harmonic devices in European contemporary music. West Coast jazz would run into such debts as with several forms of cool jazz, but bebop has hardly any such debts in the sense of direct borrowings. On the contrary, ideologically, bebop was a strong statement of rejection of any kind of eclecticism, propelled by a desire to activate something deeply buried in self. Bebop then revived tonal harmonic ideas transmitted through the blues and reconstructed and expanded others in a basically non-Western harmonic approach. The ultimate significance of all this is that the experiments in jazz during the 1940s brought back to African-American music several structural principles and techniques rooted in African traditions a Euro kibbic. These divergences from the jazz mainstream of the time initially met with a divided, sometimes hostile, response among fans and fellow musicians, especially established swing players, who bristled at the new harmonic sounds. To hostile critics, Bebop seemed to be filled with racing, nervous phrases. Despite the initial friction, by the 1950s Bebop had become an accepted part of the jazz vocabulary. Afro-Cuban jazz. Makito and Mario Borza, the general consensus among musicians and musicologists is that the first original jazz piece to be overtly based in clave was tanga, composed by Cuban-born Mario Borza and recorded by Makito and his Afro-Cubans in New York City. Tanga began as a spontaneous days cargo with jazz solos superimposed on top. This was the birth of Afro-Cuban jazz. The use of clave brought the African timeline, or key pattern, into jazz. Music organized around key patterns convey a two-celled structure, which is a complex level of African cross-rhythm. Within the context of jazz however, harmony is the primary referent, not rhythm. The harmonic progression can begin on either side of clave, and the harmonic one is always understood to be one. If the progression begins on the three side of clave, it is said to be in 3-2 clave. If the progression begins on the two side, it's in 2-3 clave. Bobby Sainabria mentions several innovations of Makita's Afro-Cubans. They were the first band to wed big band jazz arranging techniques within an original composition with jazz-oriented soloists utilizing an authentic Afro-Cuban-based rhythm section in a successful manner. Explore modal harmony from a jazz-arranging perspective. And to overtly explore the concept of clave counterpoint from an arranging standpoint. They were also the first band in the United States to publicly utilize the term Afro-Cuban as the band's moniker, thus identifying itself and acknowledging the West African roots of the musical form they were playing. It forced New York City's Latino and African American communities to deal with their common West African musical roots in a direct way, whether they wanted to acknowledge it publicly or not. Dizzy Gillespie and Chano Pozo, Mario Borza introduced bebop innovator Dizzy Gillespie to the Cuban conga drummer and composer Chano Pozo. Gillespie and Pozo's brief collaboration produced some of the most enduring Afro Cuban jazz standards. Mantica is the first jazz standard to be rhythmically based on clave. According to Gillespie, Pozo composed the layered, contrapuntal guagios of the A section and the introduction, while Gillespie wrote the bridge. Gillespie recounted, if I'd let it go like, Chano wanted it, it would have been strictly Afro-Cuban all the way. There wouldn't have been a bridge. I thought I was writing an eight-bar bridge, but... I had to keep going and ended up writing a 16-bar bridge. The bridge gave Mantica a typical jazz harmonic structure, setting the piece apart from Borza's modal tanga of a few years earlier. Gillespie's collaboration with Pizzo brought specific African-based rhythms into bebop. While pushing the boundaries of harmonic improvisation, coup bop, as it was called, also drew more directly from African rhythmic structures.
jazz arrangements with a Latin A section and a swung B section, with all choruses swung during solos, became common practice with many Latin tunes of the jazz standard repertoire. This approach can be heard on pre-1980 recordings of Mantica, A Night in Tunisia, Tintin Deo, and on Green Dolphins Street. African Cross Rhythm Cuban percussionist Mongo Santa Maria first recorded his composition Afro Blue in 1959. Afro Blue was the first jazz standard built upon a typical African three against two cross rhythm, or Himala. The song begins with the bass repeatedly playing six cross beats per each measure of 12 slash 8, or six cross beats per four main beats a Euro 6 4. The following example shows the original ostinato Afro Blue bass line. The slash note heads indicate the main beats, where you would normally tap your foot to keep time. When John Coltrane covered Afro Blue in 1963, he inverted the metric hierarchy, interpreting the tune as a three-quarters jazz waltz with duple cross beats superimposed. Originally a BB pentatonic blues, Coltrane expanded the harmonic structure of Afro Blue. Perhaps the most respected Afro-Cuban jazz combo of the late 1950s was vibraphonist Cal Tjada's band. Tjada had Mongo Santa Maria, Armando Pereza, and Willie Bobo on his early recording dates. Dixieland Revival In the late 1940s there was a revival of Dixieland music, hearkening back to the original contrapuntal New Orleans style. This was driven in large part by record company reissues of early jazz classics by the Oliver, Morton, and Armstrong bands of the 1930s. There were two types of musicians involved in the revival. One group consisted of players who had begun their careers playing in the traditional style and were returning to it or continuing what they had been playing all along. This included Bob Crosby's Bobcats, Max Kaminsky, Eddie Condon, and Wild Bill Davison. Most of this group were originally Midwesterners, although there were a small number of New Orleans musicians involved. The second group of revivalists consisted of younger musicians, such as those in the Lou Waters Band. By the late 1940s, Louis Armstrong's All Stars Band became a leading ensemble. Through the 1950s and 1960s, Dixieland was one of the most commercially popular jazz styles in the U.S., Europe, and Japan although critics paid little attention to it. Cool Jazz By the end of the 1940s, the nervous energy and tension of bebop was replaced with a tendency towards calm and smoothness, with the sounds of cool jazz, which favored long, linear melodic lines. It emerged in New York City, and dominated jazz in the first half of the 1950s. The starting point was a collection of 1949 and 1950 singles by Anonet led by Miles Davis, released as The Birth of the Cool. Later cool jazz recordings by musicians such as Chet Baker, Dave Brubeck, Bill Evans, Gilbert Evans, Stan Jays and the modern jazz quartet usually had a lighter sound that avoided the aggressive tempos and harmonic abstraction of bebop. Cool jazz later became strongly identified with the West Coast jazz scene, but also had a particular resonance in Europe, especially Scandinavia, where figures such as baritone saxophonist Lars Gullin and pianist Bengt Holberg emerged. The theoretical underpinnings of cool jazz were set out by the Chicago pianist Lenny Tristano, and its influence stretches into such later developments as bossa nova, modal jazz, and even free jazz. Hard bop Hard bop is an extension of bebop music that incorporates influences from rhythm and blues, gospel music, and blues, especially in the saxophone and piano playing. Hard bop was developed in the mid-1950s, partly in response to the vogue for cool jazz in the early 1950s. The hard bop style coalesced in 1953 and 1954, paralleling the rise of rhythm and blues. Miles Davis 1954 performance of Walk-In at the first Newport Jazz Festival, announced the style to the jazz world. The quintet Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, fronted by Blakey and featuring pianist Horace Silver and trumpeter Clifford Brown, were leaders in the hard bop movement along with Davis. Modal Jazz Modal Jazz is a development beginning in the later 1950s which takes the mode, or musical scale, as the basis of musical structure and improvisation. Previously, a solo was meant to fit into a given chord progression, 
but with modal jazz the soloist creates a melody using one or a small number of modes. The emphasis in this approach shifts from harmony to melody. Pianist Mark Levine states, historically, this caused a seismic shift among jazz musicians, away from thinking vertically, and towards a more horizontal approach. The modal theory stems from a work by George Russell. Miles Davis introduced the concept to the greater jazz world with Kind of Blue, an exploration of the possibilities of modal jazz and the best-selling jazz album of all time. In contrast to Davis' earlier work with hard bop and its complex chord progression and improvisation, the entire album was composed as a series of modal sketches, in which each performer was given a set of scales that defined the parameters of their improvisation and style. Davis recalled, I didn't write up the music for Kind of Blue, but brought in sketches for what everybody was supposed to play because I wanted a lot of spontaneity. The track So What has only two chords, D7 and A in registered trademark minus 7. Other innovators in this style include Jackie McLean, and two musicians who also played on Kind of Blue a Euro John Coltrane and Bill Evans. By the 1950s, Afro-Cuban jazz had been using modes for at least a decade as a lot of it borrowed from Cuban popular dance forms, which are structured around multiple ostinatos with only a few chords. A case in point is Mario Borza's Tanga, the first Afro-Cuban jazz piece. Makitos Afro-Cubans recorded modal tunes in the 1940s, featuring jazz soloists such as Howard McKee, Brew Moore, Charlie Parker, and Flip Phillips. There is no evidence however, that Davis or other mainstream jazz musicians were influenced by the use of modes in Afro-Cuban jazz, or other branches of Latin jazz. Free jazz Free jazz in the related form of avant-garde jazz broke through into an open space of free tonality in which meter, beat, and formal symmetry all disappeared, and a range of world music from India, Africa, and Arabia were melded into an intense, even religiously ecstatic or orgiastic style of playing. While loosely inspired by bebop, free jazz tunes gave players much more latitude. The loose harmony and tempo was deemed controversial when this approach was first developed. The bassist Charles Mingus is also frequently associated with the avant-garde and jazz, although his compositions draw from myriad styles and genres. The first major stirrings came in the 1950s, with the early work of Ornette Coleman and Cecil Taylor. In the 1960s, Performers included Archie Shep, Sun Ra, Albert Ayler, Pharaoh Sanders, John Coltrane, and others. In developing his late style, Coltrane was especially influenced by the dissonance of Ayler's trio with bassist Gary Peacock and drummer Sonny Murray, a rhythm section honed with Cecil Taylor as leader. Coltrane championed many younger free jazz musicians and under his influence impulse, became a leading free jazz record label. A series of recordings with the classic quartet in the first half of 1965 show Coltrane's playing becoming increasingly abstract, with greater incorporation of devices like multiphonics, utilization of overtones, and playing in the altissimo register, as well as a mutated return to Coltrane's sheets of sound. In the studio, he all but abandoned his soprano to concentrate on the tenor saxophone. In addition, the quartet responded to the leader by playing with increasing freedom. The group's evolution can be traced through the recordings the John Coltrane Quartet plays, Living Space, Transition, New Thing at Newport, Sunship, and First Meditations. In June 1965, Coltrane and ten other musicians recorded Ascension, a 40-minute long piece that included adventurous solos by the young avant-garde musicians, and was controversial primarily for the collective improvisation sections that separated the solos. After recording with the quartet over the next few months, Coltrane invited Farah Sanders to join the band in September 1965. While Coltrane used overblowing frequently as an emotional exclamation point, Sanders would opt to overblow his entire solo, resulting in a constant screaming and screeching in the altissimo range of the instrument. Free jazz quickly found a foothold in Europea Euro in part because musicians such as Ayla, Taylor, Steve Lacey and Eric Dolphy spent extended periods there. A distinctive European contemporary jazz flourished also because of the emergence of musicians anxious to develop new approaches reflecting their national and regional musical cultures and contexts. 
ever since the 1960s various creative centers of jazz have been developing in Europe. A good example of this is the creative jazz scene in Amsterdam. Following the work of veteran drummer Han Benink and pianist Misha Menschberg, musicians started to explore free music by collectively improvising until a certain form is found by the band. Jazz critic Kevin Witt had documented the free jazz scene in Amsterdam and some of its main exponents such as ICP Orchestra in his book New Dutch Swing. Keith Jarrett has been prominent in defending free jazz from criticism by traditionalists in the 1990s and 2000s, 1960s and 1970s. Latin Jazz Latin jazz is jazz with Latin American rhythms. Although musicians continually expand its parameters, the term Latin jazz is generally understood to have a more specific meaning than simply jazz from Latin America. A more precise term might be Afro-Latin jazz, as the jazz subgenre typically employs rhythms that either have a direct analogue in Africa, or exhibit an African rhythmic influence beyond what is ordinarily heard in other jazz. The two main categories of Latin jazz are Afro-Cuban jazz and Brazilian jazz. In the 1960s and 1970s, Many jazz musicians had only a minimum understanding of Cuban and Brazilian music. Jazz compositions using Cuban or Brazilian elements were often referred to as Latin tunes, with no distinction between a Cuban San Montuno and a Brazilian bossa nova. Even as late as 2000, in Mark Gridley's Jazz Styles, History and Analysis, a bossa nova bass line is referred to as a Latin bass figure. It was not uncommon during the 1960s and 1970s to hear a conga playing a Cuban tumbao, while the drum set and bass played a Brazilian bossa nova pattern. Many jazz standards such as Mantica, On Green Dolphins Street, and Song for My Father, have a Latin A section, and a Swang B section. Typically, the band would only play an even eighth Latin feel in the A section of the head and swing throughout all of the solos. Latin jazz specialists like Couch Jade tended to be the exception. For example, on a 1959 Lived Jada recording of A Night in Tunisia, pianist Vince Garaldi soloed through the entire form over an authentic mambo. Afro-Cuban jazz Afro-Cuban jazz often uses Afro-Cuban instruments such as congas, timbales, gar one quarter iro, and claves, combined with piano, double bass, etc. Afro-Cuban jazz began with Makitos Afro-Cubans in the early 1940s, but took off and entered the mainstream in the late 1940s when bebop musicians such as Dizzy Gillespie and Billy Taylor began experimenting with Cuban rhythms. Mongo Santa Maria and Calch Jada further refined the genre in the late 1950s. Although a great deal of Cuban-based Latin jazz is modal, Latin jazz is not always modal. It can be as harmonically expansive as post-bop jazz. For example, Tito Puente recorded an arrangement of giant steps done to an Afro-Cuban gagu and cubed. A Latin jazz piece may momentarily contract harmonically, as in the case of a percussion solo over a one or two chord piano guajillo. Guajillos, guajillos are the typical Afro-Cuban ostinato melodies, which originated in the genre known as sum. Guajillos provide a rhythmic melodic framework that may be varied within certain parameters, while still maintaining a repetitive, and thus danceable, structure. Most guajillos are rhythmically based on clave. Guajillos or guajillo fragments are commonly used motifs in Latin jazz compositions. Guajillos are one of the most important elements of the vocabulary of Afro-Cuban descarga, providing a means of tension resolution, and a sense of forward momentum within a relatively simple harmonic structure. The use of multiple, contrapuntal guajillos in Latin jazz facilitates simultaneous collective improvisation, based on theme variation. In a way, this polyphonic texture is reminiscent of the original New Orleans style of jazz. Afro-Cuban jazz renaissance Afro-Cuban jazz has been for most of its history a matter of superimposing jazz phrasing over Cuban rhythms. However, by the end of the 1970s, a new generation of New York City musicians emerged who were fluent in both salsa dance music and jazz. The time had come for a new level of integration of jazz and Cuban rhythms. This era of creativity and vitality is best represented by the Gonzalez brothers Jerry and Andy.
During 1974 to 1976 they were members of one of Eddie Pamilleri's most experimental salsa groups. Salsa was the medium, but Pamilleri was stretching the form in new ways. He incorporated parallel fourths, with McCoy Tyner type thumps. The innovations of Pamilleri, the Gonzalez brothers and others, led to an Afro-Cuban jazz renaissance in New York City. This occurred in parallel with developments in Cuba. The first Cuban band of this new wave was Iraq Air. Their car copyright Kursan introduced a style of Cubanized bebop flavored horn lines that departed from the more angular Guajio based lines typical of Cuban popular music and Latin jazz up until that time. It was based on Charlie Parker's composition Billy's Bounce, jumbled together in a way that fused clave and bebop horn lines. In spite of the ambivalence of some band members towards Iraq Air's Afro-Cuban folkloric jazz fusion, their experiments forever changed Cuban jazz, their innovations are heard in the high level of harmonic and rhythmic complexity in Cuban jazz, and in the jazzy and complex contemporary form of popular dance music known as timba. Afro-Brazilian jazz Brazilian jazz such as bossa nova is derived from samba, with influences from jazz and other 20th century classical and popular music styles. Bossa is generally moderately paced, with melodies sung in Portuguese or English. The style was pioneered by Brazilians Joe Pando Gilberto and Antonio Carlos Jobim. The related term jazz samba describes an adaptation of street samba into jazz. Bossa Nova was made popular by Elizette Cardoso's recording of Chica de Sordade on the Carna Picavolt Poundo do Amadi May LP. The initial releases by Gilberto and the 1959 film Black Orpheus achieved significant popularity in Latin America, and this spread to North America via visiting American jazz musicians. The resulting recordings by Charlie Bird and Stan Jay cemented Bossa Nova's popularity and led to a worldwide boom with 1963's Jay's Gilberto, numerous recordings by famous jazz performers such as Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra, and the entrenchment of the Bossa Nova style as a lasting influence in world music. Brazilian percussionists such as Erto Moreira and Nana Vasconcelos also influenced jazz internationally by introducing Afro-Brazilian folkloric instruments and rhythms into a wide variety of jazz styles and attracting a greater audience to them. Post-bop Post-bop jazz is a form of small combo jazz derived from earlier bop styles. The genre's origins lie in seminal work by John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Bill Evans, Charles Mingus, Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock. Generally, the term post-bop is taken to mean jazz from the mid-60s onward that assimilates influence from hard bop, modal jazz, the avant-garde, and free jazz, without necessarily being immediately identifiable as any of the above. Much post-bop was recorded on Blue Note records. Key albums include Speak No Evil by Shorter, The Real McCoy by McCoy Tyner, Maiden Voyage by Hancock, Mild Smiles by Davis, and Search for the New Land by Lee Morgan. Most post-bop artists worked in other genres as well, with a particularly strong overlap with later hard bop. Soul Jazz Soul Jazz was a development of hard bop which incorporated strong influences from blues, gospel and rhythm and blues in music for small groups, often the organ trio, which partnered a Hammond organ player with a drummer and a tenor saxophonist. Unlike hard bop, Soul jazz generally emphasized repetitive grooves and melodic hooks, and improvisations were often less complex than in other jazz styles. Horace Silver had a large influence on the soul jazz style, with songs that used funky and often gospel-based piano vamps. It often had a steadier funk-style groove, different from the swing rhythms typical of much hard bop. Important soul jazz organists included Jimmy McGriff and Jimmy Smith and Johnny Hammond Smith and influential tenor saxophone players included Eddie Locke, Joe Davies and Stanley Tarantine. African-inspired themes, there was a resurgence of interest in jazz and other forms of African-American cultural expression during the black arts movement and black nationalist period of the 1960s and 1970s. African themes became popular. There were many new jazz compositions with African-related titles, Black Nile, Blue Nile, Obiran African, Zambia, Appointment in Ghana, Marabi, Yoruba, and many more. Pianist Randy Weston's music incorporated African elements, for example, 
the large-scale Suite Uru Africa, and High Life, music from the New African Nations. Both Western and saxophonist Stanley Tarantine covered the Nigerian Bobby Benson's piece Niger Mambo, which features Afro-Caribbean and jazz elements within a West African high lifestyle. Some musicians such as Pharaoh Sanders, Hubert Laws and Wayne Shorter began using African instruments such as kalimbas, bells, beaded goods and other instruments not traditional to jazz. Rhythm During this period, there was an increased use of the typical African 12-8 cross rhythmic structure in jazz. Herbie Hancock's Sucko Tash on Inventions and Dimensions is an open-ended modal, 12-8 improvised jam. Hancock's pattern of attack points, rather than the pattern of pitches, is the primary focus of his improvisations, accompanied by Paul Chambers on bass, and percussionist Osvaldo Martinez playing a traditional Afro-Cuban checker a copyright part, and Willie Bobo playing an abacua bell pattern on a snare drum with brushes. The first jazz standard composed by a non-Latino to use an overt African 12-8 cross rhythm was Wayne Shorter's Footprints. On the version recorded on Miles Smiles by Miles Davis, the bass switches to a 4-4 trisillo figure at 220. Footprints is not, however, a Latin jazz tune. African rhythmic structures are accessed directly by Ron Carter and Tony Williams via the rhythmic sensibilities of swing. Throughout the piece, the four beats, whether sounded or not, are maintained as the temporal referent. In the example below, the main beats are indicated by slashed note heads, which do not indicate bass notes. Pentatonic scales The use of pentatonic scales was another African associated trend. The use of pentatonic scales in Africa probably goes back thousands of years. McCoy Tyner perfected the use of the pentatonic scale in his solos. Tyner also used parallel fifths and fourths, which are common harmonies in West Africa. The minor pentatonic scale is often used in blues improvisation. Like a blues scale, a minor pentatonic scale can be played over all of the chords in a blues. The following pentatonic lick was played over blues changes by Joe Henderson on Horace Silver's African Queen. Jazz pianist, theorist, and educator Mark Levine refers the scale generated by beginning on the fifth step of a pentatonic scale, as the V-pentatonic scale. Levine points out that the V-pentatonic scale works for all three chords of the standard 2VI jazz progression. This is a very common progression, used in pieces such as Miles Davis's tune-up. The following example shows the V-pentatonic scale over a 2VI progression. Accordingly, John Coltrane's Giant Steps, with its 26 chords per 16 bars, can be played using only three pentatonic scales. Coltrane studied Nicholas Slonimsky's Thesaurus of Scales and Melodic Patterns, which contains material that is virtually identical to portions of Giant Steps. The harmonic complexity of Giant Steps is on the level of the most advanced 20th century art music. Superimposing the pentatonic scale over giant steps is not merely a matter of harmonic simplification, but also a sort of Africanizing of the piece, which provides an alternate approach for soloing. Mark Levine observes that when mixed in with more conventional playing the changes, pentatonic scales provide structure and a feeling of increased space. Jazz Fusion in the late 1960s and early 1970s the hybrid form of jazz-rock fusion was developed by combining jazz improvisation with rock rhythms, electric instruments and the highly amplified stage sound of rock musicians such as Jimi Hendrix. Jazz fusion music often uses mixed meters, odd time signatures, syncopation, complex chords and harmonies. All Music Guide states that until around 1967, the worlds of jazz and rock were nearly completely separate. However, as rock became more creative and its musicianship improved, and as some in the jazz world became bored with hard bop and did not want to play strictly avant-garde music, the two different idioms began to trade ideas and occasionally combine forces. Miles Davis New Directions In 1969 Davis fully embraced the electric instrument approach to jazz within a silent way, which can be considered his first fusion album. Composed of two side-long suites edited heavily by producer Tio Masiro, this quiet, static album would be equally influential upon the development of ambient music. As Davies recalls, 
The music I was really listening to in 1968 was James Brown, the great guitar player Jimi Hendrix, and a new group who had just come out with a hit record, Dance to the Music, Sly and the Family Stone. I wanted to make it more like rock. When we recorded in a silent way I just threw out all the chord sheets and told everyone to play off of that. Two contributors to In a Silent Way also joined organist Larry Young to create one of the early acclaimed fusion albums, Emergency. By the Tony Williams Lifetime. Psychedelic Jazz, Bitches Brew, Davis's Bitches Brew was his most successful of this era. Although inspired by rock and funk, Davis's fusion creations were original, and brought about a type of new avant-garde, electronic, psychedelic jazz, as far from pop music as any other Davis work. Herbie Hancock, Davis alumnus, pianist Herbie Hancock, released four albums of the short-lived psychedelic jazz subgenre, Mwandishi, Crossings, and Sextant. The rhythmic background was a mix of rock, funk, and African-type textures. Musicians who worked with Davis formed the four most influential fusion groups, where the Report and Mahavish New Orchestra emerged in 1971 and was soon followed by Return to Forever and the Headhunters. Weather Report, Weather Report's debut album was in the electronic, psychedelic jazz vein. The self-titled Weather Report caused a sensation in the jazz world on its arrival, thanks to the pedigree of the group of Euro unregistered trademark S members and their unorthodox approach to their music. The album featured a softer sound than would be the case in later years but is still considered a classic of early fusion. It built on the avant-garde experiments which Soy Null and Shorter had pioneered with Miles Davis on Bitches Brew but taking the music further. To emphasize the group's rejection of standard methodology, the album opened with the inscrutable avant-garde atmospheric piece Milky Way. Dan Beat described the album as music beyond category, and awarded it Album of the Year in the magazine's polls that year. Where the report's subsequent releases were creative funk jazz works. Jazz rock, although jazz purists protested the blend of jazz and rock, some of jazz's significant innovators crossed over from the contemporary hard bop scene into fusion. In addition to using the electric instruments of rock, such as the electric guitar, electric bass, electric piano and synthesizer keyboards, Fusion also used the powerful amplification, fuzz pedals, wah-wah pedals, and other effects used by 1970s-era rock bands. Notable performers of jazz fusion included Miles Davis, Eddie Harris, keyboardists Joe Zoy Null, Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, vibraphonist Gary Burton, drummer Tony Williams, violinist Gene Luke Ponty, guitarists Larry Coriel, Al Di Miola, John McLaughlin and Frank Zappa, saxophonist Wayne Shorter and bassists Jaco Pastorius and Stanley Clark. Jazz fusion was also popular in Japan where the band Hashio Pier released over 30 fusion albums. In the 21st century, almost all jazz has influences from other nations and styles of music, making jazz fusion as much a common practice as style. Jazz funk. Developed by the mid-1970s, Jazz funk is characterized by a strong backbeat, electrified sounds, and often, the presence of electronic analog synthesizers. Jazz funk also draws influences from traditional African music, Afro-Cuban rhythms and Jamaican reggae, notably Kingston band leader Sonny Bradshaw. Another feature is the shift of proportions between composition and improvisation, arrangements, melody and overall writing were heavily emphasized. The integration of funk, soul and R&B music into jazz resulted in the creation of a genre whose spectrum is wide and ranges from strong jazz improvisation to soul, funk or disco with jazz arrangements, jazz riffs and jazz solos, and sometimes soul vocals. Early examples are Herbie Hancock's Headhunters Band and the Miles Davis album On the Corner. The latter, from 1972, began Davis' foray into jazz funk and was, he claimed, an attempt at reconnecting with the young black audience which had largely forsaken jazz for rock and funk. While there is a discernible rock and funk influence in the timbres of the instruments employed, other tonal and rhythmic textures, such as the Indian tambora and tablas, and Cuban congas and bongos, create a multi-layered soundscape. 
The album was a culmination of sorts of the Musique Concrete E approach that Davis and producer Tio Masiro had begun to explore in the late 1960s. Other trends, musicians began improvising jazz tunes on unusual instruments, such as the jazz harp, electrically amplified and wah-wah pedal jazz violin, and bagpipes. Jazz continued to expand and change, influenced by other types of music, such as world music, avant-garde classical music, and rock and pop music. Guitarist John McLaughlin's Mahavishnu Orchestra played a mix of rock and jazz infused with East Indian influences. The ECM record label began in Germany in the 1970s with artists including Keith Jarrett, Paul Bley, the Pat Metheny Group, Jan Garbrook, Ralph Towner, Kenny Wheeler, John Taylor, John Sermon and Berard Weber, establishing a new chamber music aesthetic, featuring mainly acoustic instruments, and sometimes incorporating elements of world music and folk. 1980s In 1987, the U.S. House of Representatives and Senate passed a bill proposed by Democratic Representative John Conyers, Jr. to define jazz as a unique form of American music stating, among other things, that jazz is hereby designated as a rare and valuable national American treasure to which we should devote our attention, support and resources to make certain it is preserved, understood and promulgated. It passed in the House of Representatives on September 23, 1987 and in the Senate on November 4, 1987. Resurgence of Traditionalism While the 1970s had been dominated by the fusion and free jazz genres, the early 1980s saw a re-emergence of a more conventional kind of acoustic or straight-ahead jazz. Perhaps the most prominent manifestation of this resurgence was the emergence of trumpeter Wynton Marsalis, who strove to create music within what he believed was the tradition, rejecting both fusion and free jazz and creating extensions of the small and large forms initially pioneered by such artists as Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington as well as the hard bob of the 1950s. Several musicians who had been prominent in the fusion genre during the 1970s began to record acoustic jazz once more, including Chick Corea and Herbie Hancock. Even the early 80s music of Miles Davis, although still recognizably fusion, adopted a far more conventional approach than his abstract work of the 1970s. A similar reaction took place against free jazz, according to Ted Giller. The very leaders of the avant-garde started to signal a retreat from the core principles of free jazz. Anthony Braxton began recording standards over familiar chord changes. Cecil Taylor played duets in concert with Mary Lou Williams and let her set out structured harmonies and familiar jazz vocabulary under his blistering keyboard attack. And the next generation of progressive players would be even more accommodating, moving inside and outside the changes without thinking twice. Musicians such as David Murray or Don Pullen may have felt the call of freeform jazz, but they never forgot all the other ways one could play African American music for fun and profit. Smooth Jazz In the early 1980s, a commercial form of jazz fusion called pop fusion, or smooth jazz became successful and garnered significant radio airplay in quiet storm time slots at radio stations in urban markets across the U.S. This helped to establish or bolster the careers of vocalists including Al Jarreau, Anita Baker, Cherka Khan and Saad, as well as saxophonists including Grover Washington, J.R., Kenny G., Kirk Hallam, Boney James and David Sanborn. In general, smooth jazz is down-tempo, and has a lead, melody-playing instrument. Saxophone is a euro especially soprano and tenor euro, and legato electric guitar are popular. In his Newsweek article The Problem with Jazz Criticism Stanley Crouch considers Miles Davis playing of fusion as a turning point that led to smooth jazz. Critic Aaron J. West has countered the often negative perceptions of smooth jazz, stating, I challenge the prevalent marginalization and malignment of smooth jazz in the standard jazz narrative. Furthermore, I question the assumption that smooth jazz is an unfortunate and unwelcomed evolutionary outcome of the jazz fusion era. Instead, I argue that smooth jazz is a long-lived musical style that merits multidisciplinary analyses of its origins, critical dialogues, performance practice, and reception. Acid jazz, new jazz and jazz rap. Acid jazz developed in the UK in the 1980s and 1990s, 
influenced by jazz funk and electronic dance music. Jazz funk musicians such as Roy Ayers and Donald Byrd are often credited as forerunners of acid jazz. While acid jazz often contains various types of electronic composition, it is just as likely to be played live by musicians, who often showcase jazz interpretation as part of their performance. New jazz is influenced by jazz harmony and melodies. There are usually no improvisational aspects. It ranges from combining live instrumentation with beats of jazz house, exemplified by Saint Germain, Jazz Nova and Fila Brasilia, to more band-based improvised jazz with electronic elements, such as that of the cinematic orchestra, Cabal, and the Norwegian future jazz style pioneered by Bugger Seltoft, Jaga Jazzist, Nils Petter Molvar, and others. New jazz can be very experimental in nature and can vary widely in sound and concept. Jazz rap developed in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and incorporates jazz influence into hip-hop. In 1988, Gangsta released the debut single Words I Manifest, sampling Dizzy Gillespie's 1962 Night in Tunisia, and Stetsa Sonic released Talk in All That Jazz, sampling Lonnie Liston Smith. Gangsta's debut LP, No More Mr. Nee Sky, and their track Jazz Thing, sampled Charlie Parker and Ramsey Lewis. Groups making up the native tongues posse tended towards jazzy releases. These include the Jungle Brothers' debut Straight Out the Jungle, and A Tribe Called Quest's People's Instinctive Travels and the Paths of Rhythm and the Low End Theory. Rap duo Pete Rock and CL Smooth incorporated jazz influences on their 1992 debut Mecca and the Soul Brother. Beginning in 1993, rapper Guru's Jazz Mataz series used jazz musicians during the studio recordings. Though jazz rap had achieved little mainstream success, Miles Davis' final album, Do Bop, was based around hip-hop beats and collaborations with producer Easy Moby. Davis' ex-bandmate Herbie Hancock returned to hip-hop influences in the mid-90s, releasing the album This Is Da Drum in 1994. Punk Jazz and Jazzle The relaxation of orthodoxy concurrent with post-punk in London and New York City led to a new appreciation for jazz. In London, the pop group began to mix free jazz, along with dub reggae, into their brand of punk rock. In NYC, No Wave took direct inspiration from both free jazz and punk. Examples of this style include Lydia Lunch's Queen of Siam, the work of James Chance and the Contortions, who mixed soul with free jazz and punk, Grey, and the Lounge Lizards, who were the first group to call themselves punk jazz. John Zorn began to make note of the emphasis on speed and dissonance that was becoming prevalent in punk rock and incorporated this into free jazz. This began in 1986 with the album Spy vs. Spy, a collection of Ornette Coleman tunes done in the contemporary thrashcore style. The same year, Sonny Sharrock, Peter Bra Paragraph TZMANN, Bill Lawswell, and Ronald Shannon Jackson recorded the first album under the name Last Exit a similarly aggressive blend of thrash and free jazz. These developments are the origins of jazzle, the fusion of free jazz with hardcore punk. In the 1990s, punk jazz and jazzle began to reflect the increasing awareness of elements of extreme metal in hardcore punk. A new style of metallic jazzle was developed by Icebun, from Salt Lake City, and Candiria, from New York City, though anticipated by Naked City and Painkiller. This tendency also takes inspiration from jazz inflections in technical death metal, such as the work of cynic and atheist, M. Bass. The M. Bass movement was started in the 1980s by a loose collective of young African-American musicians in New York who had a new sound and specific ideas about creative expression. With a strong foothold in the tradition represented by Charlie Parker and John Coltrane, and in contemporary African-American groove music, Musicians such as saxophonist Steve Coleman, Greg Osby, and Gary Thomas developed complex but grooving music. In the 1990s most M bass participants turned to more conventional music, but Coleman, the most active participant, continued developing his music in accordance with the M bass concept. Coleman developed philosophical and spiritual concepts from aspects of culture he found around the world that express fundamental facets of nature and human existence in a holistic way. He used these to give his music a meaning similar to the intentions of religious music, 
European composers like J.S. Bach and Ludwig van Beethoven, and musicians in the tradition represented by Coltrane. Coleman's audience decreased but his music and concepts influenced many musicians of Euro, both in terms of music technique and of the music's meaning. Hence, M bass changed from a movement of a loose collective of young musicians to a kind of informal Coleman school, with a much advanced but already originally implied concept. 1990s R Euro 2010s Jazz since the 1990s has been characterized by a pluralism in which no one style dominates but rather a wide range of active styles and genres are popular. Individual performers often play in a variety of styles, sometimes in the same performance. Pianist Brad Mahdor and power trio The Bad Plus have explored contemporary rock music within the context of the traditional jazz acoustic piano trio for example recording instrumental jazz versions of songs by rock musicians. The Bad Plus have also incorporated elements of free jazz into their music. A firm avant-garde or free jazz stance has been maintained by some players, such as saxophonists Greg Osby and Charles Gale, while others, such as James Carter, have incorporated free jazz elements into a more traditional framework. Harry Connick Junior is a jazz musician and singer who has seven top 20 U.S. albums, including ten number one U.S. jazz albums, earning more number one albums than any other artist in the U.S. jazz chart history. New vocalists, such as Diana Krall, Nora Jones, Cassandra Wilson, Kurt Erling and Jamie Cullum, have achieved popularity with a mix of traditional jazz and pop rock forms. Players emerging since the 1990s and usually performing in largely straight-ahead settings include pianists Jason Moran and Vijaya, guitarist Kurt Rosenwinkel, vibraphonist Stefan Harris, trumpeters Roy Hargrove and Terence Blanchard, saxophonists Chris Potter and Joshua Redman, clarinetist Ken Peplaski, and bassist Christian McBride. Although jazz rock fusion reached the height of its popularity in the 1970s, the use of electronic instruments and rock-derived musical elements in jazz continued in the 1990s and 2000s. Musicians using this approach have included Pat Metheny, John Abercrombie, John Schofield, and Swedish group EST. See also Cape Jazz, Glossary of Jazz in Popular Music, Jazz Poetry, Timeline of Jazz Education, Victorian Jazz Archive, Lists, Category Jazz Compositions by Key, List of jazz bassists, list of jazz clubs, list of jazz drummers, list of jazz festivals, list of jazz guitarists, list of jazz institutions and organizations, list of jazz pianists, list of jazz standards, list of jazz violinists, list of jazz vocalists, notes. References Further reading, Leon, Len 1980. The 101 Best Jazz Albums, A History of Jazz on Records. New York, W. Morrow & Company 476p, Kelwood B&W Photos. ISBN 0-688-08720-3PBK, Williams, Martin, ed. 1959. The Art of Jazz, Essays on the Nature and Development of Jazz. London, Castle, 1960, Cop. 1959. 248p, Hill with examples in musical notation, external links, Jazz Foundation of America, Jazz at the Smithsonian Museum, Alabama Jazz Hall of Fame website, Jazz Artist and Discography Resource, RedHotJazz.com, Jazz at Lincoln Center website, Jazz at Lincoln Center Hall of Fame, American Jazz Museum website, the International Archives for the Jazz Organ, Classic and Contemporary Jazz Music, the Jazz Archive at Duke University, Jazz Festivals in Europe, free 1920s jazz collection available for downloading at archive.org, down beta Euro unregistered trademark S Jazz 101 A Guide to the Music This section of the Downbeat magazine website has several short pages to allow the beginning student of jazz to acquire an education. Nen, Charlie, Earl Father Hines, 8. One hour documentary filmed at Blues Alley Jazz Club, Washington, D.C. Produced and directed by Charlie Nairn for UKA TV Television, 1975. Original 16mm film, plus outtakes of additional tunes, archived in British Film Institute Library at bfi.org.
also at http www.itstudios.com. DVD copies with the Jean Grey Hargrove Music Library, University of California, Berkeley, California. Also at University of Chicago Hogan Jazz Archive, Tulane University in New Orleans and at the Louis Armstrong House Museum Libraries, see also www.jatsonefilm.com slash documentaries. Jazz Collected News and Commentary at the New York Times, Jazz Collected News and Commentary at the Guardian, Jazz at DMOZ.